Okay, so bcashfs. New copy on write file system descended from bcash. Been working on it for a number of years. Got all the fancy features. Uh, rough feature parity with ButterFS and ZFS. But designed more as a file system on top of a database and with a very high performance feature. So performance is more like XFS. And hopefully more reliable and robust than than what our test is now for being. Okay. That's pretty much it. Um, Definitely people should go to Kent's Patreon. Um, I think the company that was sponsoring your work had some financial difficulties. Yeah, they got hit by the strikes out in LA. That was their main market is uh, selling to uh, the uh, video production houses. So they had to cut back. Hey, we're, we're super excited that it is in Linux Next. I think that's awesome. Um, we're, I think this has been quite a significant achievement for you. You've been working on this for a while. So hats off to you, Kent. Oh. Lots yeah, and lots nice. of grinding through bugs and got uh here's all the all the major feature work is done. Snapshots is the last big thing. More kind of say was he. We're not starting to help out more. Uh they're gonna be uh porting over butter FS snapshot test test next. Lots of big milestones. So my understanding is that snapshot feature was, I think you're pretty proud of that. Is there any other file system that comes close? Uh, I have heard of other proprietary file systems that do snapshots in a similar way. Uh, I haven't actually heard of anything that does writable snapshots with the, the key versioning technique. Okay. Can I just yeah, go for it, Sergey. BcacheFS <laughs> is a so versioning databases that have been around for a while, and all that is is you, your your part of your key is a version number, so you can store multiple versions, and you can use that in the lookup. That it's it's fairly straightforward to turn that into a, a snapshots algorithm, but the straightforward part is turning that into a read-only snapshots algorithm. You take a snapshot, you bump the version number, you start inserting keys with a a new version and not overriding the, the old version. Uh, BcacheFS extends that into writable snapshots where the version numbers form a tree. And really the only trick there is on lookup, we have to skip over keys and unrelated uh, parts of the snapshot tree but it all works out pretty nicely. Except for some of the deletion algorithms where you have to collapse and trade that get fun. I worked on that last night. Very cool. <laughs> Sergey, do you want to say something? Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, what other advantages compared to XFS and ZFS, and will we be finally able to put you know, people who wanted to use ZFS and Linux to rest? Yeah, so versus XFS, uh, XFS performs the best at scale uh, according to all the benchmarks I've seen, which makes sense considering the heritage. Uh, it, it came out of SGI back in the 90s when they wanted a, a high performance file system suitable for video streaming, and they extended it with real time uh, features. And that was when people were starting to first use B trees in on just file systems, not just databases. And they went wild with the, the whole B tree thing and, and did that pretty well. So it scales and it's fast, but it's still the same feature set as all the other Unix file systems of that era. So no checksumming. I will say uh, you're, I think you're very polite on the kernel mailing list. I mean, it's not easy to get something merged. And I think your polite firmness was a, a good strategy. <laughs> uh, thanks. I, I try. 
<laughs> that place does get frustrating at times. <laughs> yeah. There, there's always like someone that just on our stick in the mud. But yeah. I think Sergey was kind of curious about your interest in the herd. If you're somewhat interested or not, um, do you know much about it? Uh, I know a little bit about it. I first followed the big uh, microkernel debate back in the day. Okay. Right. A, I, I actually wasn't aware that it was still going. <laughs> So I, I'm running it in real hardware in my T43. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it's got 1.5 gigabytes. It's it's cheap, but it works. Okay. Um, Sergey is definitely so. the more technical herd person of okay. everyone in the room. So, <laughs> so contrary, to the, <laughs> contrary to the popular belief, it's not dead. It's not discontinued. It's been worked on. It's working pretty well these days. Uh, Unfortunately, the original developers have largely left. So there are just us now, well, mostly Samuel, who couldn't attend. Uh, yeah, it's been worked on by slowly. There are still, you know, some areas are missing entirely, like, not seriously, audio support. <laughs> <laughs> the module support? Audio, like, any of the sound stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sergey and I are both connected on um, not Linux at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> not <Nor can't. laughs> We agree we weren't going to talk right. about that. I, I, I can talk about that. But what I want to say is that the heart exists. It's been worked on. It runs. Uh, it has two real distros working on it. On top of the heart, Debian and Wix. Yeah, right. yeah. Remember Debian doing that back in the day? It still does do that. And in fact, it's just a regular Debian system, except that instead of Linux, it's got a heart. So kernel specific stuff is different. Like you can't, you don't have kernel models to do file system mounts differently. But the rest of it is just the usual Debian uh, because you know, it's still GNU, it's still Debian. So it's a very familiar and yet different experience. It's not really? like using a BSD system or Mac OS or something else. How would you compare the herd to say L4? Well, first of all, L4 itself is a microkernel and the, the herd is not. <laughs> the herd uh, is a, a, that's also something like, that people I guess tend the L4 to doesn't really have about. a specific user land, does it? Uh, yes, so the herd, the microkernel in, in heart is Mac, right? Mm -hmm. The heart is a bunch of uh, user space, user land servers running on top of Mac, implementing the functionality of a you know, traditional Linux kernel as this bunch of microservices. And in fact, the heart stands for heart of Unix replacing diamonds or something like that. Uh, so there was a project to replace Mac with L4 in heart. Uh, but it never got anywhere, and I'm not sure if it's possible at all. Uh, Mac yeah. obviously being the first generation microkernel, it's not it's not really any good. It's slow. It's got all the design issues. They tried to, but again, it works. They tried to replace it with like L4 Pistachio or something. I don't think they ever tried to replace it with SEL4. So I'm not sure. Maybe it's still no, no, still no not SEL4. But in any case, it would require like a major redesign of the card because the card is heavily reliant on Mac features. So Kent, what's uh, Bcache's fuse status? Is it is it working? Would you recommend people to use it that way? No, it's uh, kind of in the early initial stages. So where we're at is about a 90% of the file system code uh, builds and runs in user space. So it's it's a unified code base between kernel and user space. Uh, this is important for FSDK. So most file systems have FSDK as a whole separate implementation, and I wasn't going to do that. So that's actually one of the things I wanted to ask you: How is it possible? How can you, you know, take kernel land code and run it in users? Well, I mean, obviously we yeah. are doing that, but how are you doing that? Because obviously you must be using, for instance, Linux's login primitives. 
I have a general stuff. I've got a little shim layer that maps uh, the locking primitives to uh, P threads locking primitives. Uh, maps the block uh, IO API to AIO. Uh, a very simple implementation of work queues, timers, so on. Yeah, so there's there's a it's like twenty thousand line shim layer. Uh, some of it's kind of messy and hacked together, and I would. If I had enough time for more projects, I would love to get that to be more of a project uh, and maybe get people interested in taking parts of the Linux kernel and making it library code. Things like R hash tables. There's no good reason for R hash tables to just be Linux kernel code. That code builds and runs in user space with practically no changes. Uh, Something yes. that you might not know is that actually the many of the device drivers used in the heart and the network stack used in the heart is actually ported from Linux. So it runs in user space, and we still have a similar you know, shim layer that lets it run in user space. And ours is ancient, it's from Linux 2.6 era, and it would be great if you know the thing we're talking about materialized and we could we could use it for the heart too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe if we... Uh, we could collaborate. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a big problem, and it's hard to know how to cut it apart in a generally useful way. And really, we need to get these changes upstream and get the kernel people okay with the idea of taking this, this mono repo and having this library code cut apart in a way that it can be used more easily in other other projects. Have you heard of uh, NetBSD run kernels? I've heard of it. I don't know anything about it. It's basically NetBSD's kind of project to split their kernel apart and run bits of it in user space. So it kind of sounds, yeah, so it kind of sounds okay. like similar to what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's that's going on right now in the kernel is uh, Rust is becoming more of a thing. <laughs> and I'm so they like Rust. Uh, that got some giggles. What was, what's, what's your take on that? I, mean, so I, I love Rust. That's awesome. <laughs> Rust being Rust. Yeah, we're and just eat. excited for Rust. Uh, well, me too. I was just at the Rust for Linux conference out in Spain, presenting on Bcash of us there and uh, seeing what's going on with their um, type, uh, type pinning is still uh, a big headache. Rust really wants types to be movable, and the Linux kernel has types that do not want to be movable. All right. So I've been saying that I think the kernel is probably going to have to be the one to change on this because this is really going to require deep compiler hacks and, and rust to fix there. How, how does Lydas feel about that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the opposite that rust always have to give. <laughs> I, I'm thinking we'll wait until like another year to present on this to the kernel people until <laughs> rust is more established. And I, I don't want to pick that fight yet. <laughs> So we're going to have to change our link list work. Okay. It's not going to be pleasant. So, Kent, you touched on it already. You made it sound like bcachefs is pretty portable. Um, we were hoping to port it to the herd. Sergey is mm -hmm. thinking about creating a Fuse implementation from scratch. Hold on. Let me, let me finish my thought with the, the rest. Oh, yeah, go for uh, it. What, sorry, I brought that up. Uh, so, the rest people expect to be able to use... Uh, other libraries from Chris.io and Rust has lots of little libraries that could be used in kernel land without any changes. This is not standard practice in the C world. In, in C world, libraries tend to be much bigger and you can't use them in the kernel without a bunch of changes. And coming up with a process for how we use code from external repositories is something that really needs to happen. And 
that's that's something where old, old stodgy see people uh, need to be convinced. But if we convince them for Rust, then we should be able to convince them for C. That would give us an avenue to take kernel code and make it an external dependency. Don't, I imagine those old C hackers are saying uh, you want to minimize dependencies because now you have to make sure those dependencies I, are secure. The, their arguments are, are along the lines of, ah, oh, we've always cut and pasted code from external repositories, it's fine. <laughs> So, no, we, we know that we have better ways of doing this today. We just need to come up with a tool and come up with the process and, and make it happen. And if we do that, then we can do like the NetBSD rum kernel thing and get that effort going. And maybe people will pick up on that. That would be great for us and we would definitely like to run modern Linux code on the herd. Yeah, that'd be great. Maybe we don't want to name drop people, but who are your allies in this uh, <laughs> movement, Kent? <laughs> uh, Miguel would be. Uh, as far as old kernel people, I'm not sure. I haven't. I haven't really been talking to people about this in a while. I've I've talked about it on the list, but I haven't. I've been too distracted to kind of push this effort in a while. Uh, the the next step would be writing up a just just really writing up the actual process and tooling, figuring out how to do it technically. Like if we pre present people something a, a process technically that doesn't suck. That's the big question because Git submodules. I don't know anyone who really enjoys using those. Uh, <laughs> Cargo has its own issues. Uh, Cargo doesn't tend to an exact SHA one by default, and that's a sh an issue. It, yeah, it's, is, it's, is it's even using Cargo currently, or is it building with its own? I don't think uh, people are using Cargo yet. Uh, people are still doing the the base code from external repositories thing. Hmm. Okay. So that would be a way to uh, get some attention, make get get your name noted, known in the Linux kernel circles if uh, you get that done right. And it's really going to be a matter of just coming up with a process that's acceptable to everyone. A lot of talking to people, uh, possibly writing a new tool, or a lot of research to finding find a tool that can be blessed. Can you give us some examples of C libraries that can be run in the Linux kernel with minimal changes that people could work towards? So right now, uh, this is done for compression algorithms, uh, encryption algorithms, uh, the Z standard code, uh, is pretty much imported from a fork version of the user space libz standard. Then with uh, uh, changes applied locally in the kernel to uh, or just style to uh, conform the kernel uh, style, but we should not be doing that. That just makes it impossible to merge changes back and forth. Makes uh, sense. Uh, I'd have to dig around to find other examples. Uh, the bigger use case would actually be kernel code that would be really nice to use in user space. Our hash tables uh, is a really good example. Our hash tables are a really slick, high performance, uh, dynamically resizable, completely lockless hash table implementation came out of the uh, networking land and now it's used all over the place. And I haven't seen anything like that in user space. Hmm. And yet that code works in user space just fine. We should just make it a library that everyone can use. So it's currently not a library that everyone can use? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's it's kernel library code. It lives in lib in the, in the kernel tree. But you can use that code in, in user space, essentially zero changes, if you've got RCU already available. And Libar URCU is already a thing, so. Okay. 
Sergey, do you have any technical questions you wanted to ask, Kent? Right. Let's chat about the you know getting Pikachu fast onto the heart. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I covered the the shim layer. Uh, that's how FSK works. So the part that's missing is a shim layer for the kernel VFS interfaces. Uh, we were actually discussing this on the mailing list uh, and with the XFS people recently. I, I started on a Fuse port of uh, vCacheFS a while back that just targets the libfuse directly. I'm not convinced that that's the way we want to go because this is something that doesn't... If we had a actual like Fuse to VFS shim layer, then we could probably get a pretty high performance fuse port that way. And then we could port any Linux kernel file system to user space with minimal effort. Right, that would also be pretty cool. Yeah. There's. That's right, that fuse it basically was originally designed to take Linux's VFS API and serialize it and transfer it over to our device. Yeah, so now we just need to complete that effort and make it look like the Linux VFS in user space. Right, make it compatible, source code compatible. Yes, yeah, so that'd be an implement. We need, at the start, an implementation of the uh, center VFS inode cache in user space, uh, complete with uh, shrinking memory reclaim, <laughs> allocation of blocks and storage devices. Well, that's a large topic. <laughs> Okay, that's the starting point. Uh, have to decide if there's going to be a page cache in user space or just in the kernel. Probably not. Mapping the whole page cache stuff to fuse. I, I haven't thought about that. Yeah, the inode cache is definitely the starting point. So one of the big questions that I have is whether we should try to pursue making the Fuse version of PikachuFS work by basically writing a new Fuse implementation from scratch, or whether we should you know, look at your Fuse version and try to write our own bindings to the Hertz native file system API. Uh, and if you plan to you know, drop the libfuse version, it sounds like the latter would be preferred. He's saying to make a a bridge between the kernel VFS and Fuse, so it'd still be using Fuse of a sort, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Fuse would be our, our, our common wire format. Yeah, so and, on our side, we'd probably still use a Fuse uh, translator to run. But it won't be. System. In any case, we won't be using the fuses wire format on the heart because the heart's native you know, file system protocol is very different. I mean, it's conceptually equivalent, but it's using Mac API and it's quite different from what Linux does. Uh, so if you, if you had a compatible fuse, fuse, it would be written from scratch against heart's native API, uh, but it would you know, present the same libfuse API. Yeah, that would work. Right. An alternative would be to to just write uh, to, to hook up your PikachuFS codes, most of it, to Hertz native file system framework. That would certainly require more work, more, more like because specific work. But then it wouldn't benefit everyone else because uh, having a work confused implementation would be available in of itself. Yeah. Uh... I, I wouldn't be the person to well, say which of, which of those is preferable. Uh, I feel like the, the Fuse API, that's a, a pretty thin layer. I don't think there'd be that much benefit to cutting that out. But I, I don't know the semantics of the Herd's uh, file system APIs. Yeah, I think we call it what lib disk fs on the herd. So it's either lib disk fs or fuse. Well, there are uh, several several frameworks. Yeah, with disk fs, lib net fs, lib 
three of us. They used to exist uh, like three of us too, but it was deleted because it never really worked. Uh, these are all different frameworks that implement slightly different semantics. Uh, yeah, but they all they all implement the same interfaces that are then used by glibc and by others. Uh, in the end, that's 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 how hers DFS works. There is no central you know, server, a, central place. It's all distributed. We have like a partial implementation of libc's written, but Sergey wants to rewrite it because it's like only right. So as far as I can see, libfuse has two layers of API, the low level and the normal layer. Uh, and the normal layer is synchronous and deals with file names. And the lower layer is asynchronous and it deals with inodes, as in row inode numbers. Mm -hmm. Right. So there was this libfuse for the heart project. I think it was somebody, a Google Summer of Code project, but I'm not sure about that. And uh, it is set to work. It didn't seem to work for me, but OK. Hmm. Uh, it was implemented on top of libnetfs, one of the Hertz native file system frameworks. Uh, and it, it's an OK match, so it uses APIs mostly map OK to NetFS APIs. But that's, that wouldn't work at all for the asynchronous version. And as far as I can see, yours Fuse command, it uses the low level API. So we would have to write it in any case. And then I'd make libfuse a framework of its own. So it wouldn't be using lib libnetfs, it would be a peer to libnetfs. Well, if your fuse implementation is not done and bcachefs' fuse implementation is not done, then it sounds like you might want to look at just doing the, the herd native. Right. See if that's any easier, and maybe then compare that code to the where the bcache of us uh, implementation implementation is going, and see what the like, semantic matches look like or mismatches, and if it's worth consolidating. Well, Kent, my question for you is: I think you are interesting in using the fuse implementation of bcachefs on Linux to aid you in debugging. Is that still a goal? Yeah. That's, that, would, that would be a really useful thing to have, a tool to have in our, in our pocket in the future. If the file system is crashing on some customer machine, then it would be nice to be able to just switch to running it in user space and attach GDB to it. Trying to attach a debugger onto a random customer machine, that's never easy. Uh, we haven't really... Uh, had any use cases where that would be useful so far, though, so I don't know that it's the biggest priority. We're in really, really good shape as far as uh, log messages and error messages and being able to debug that way. Generally, if something bad happens, then it will result in uh, an unrecoverable file system until FSEK is taught how to fix it. So then we, then we just use the dump tool and have them send me their metadata, and then I can debug that on my own machine. Uh, we're not... Uh, issues where like the file system is crashing, that hasn't really been an issue. Dang. <laughs> it's a cleaner code base than even XFS, if you ask me. Okay. How do, <laughs> do, do you and Dave Chitter kind of like rip on each other every now and then? No, the I wouldn't. I wouldn't rip on the XFS people. <laughs> XFS code base is in way better shape than EXT4 or ButterFS. I rip on those people. <laughs> <laughs> but but still, uh, I've I've been on bug hunts with Dave once or twice when I I tripped over an XFS bug and help them debug it. I'm like, oh my god, this would not be happening at the cash up at Slam. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess Sergey and I, maybe more Sergey and Samuel, got to figure out the libdesk FS versus Fuse. Um, could be that... What were you going to say, Sergey? Uh, right, I was going to wonder 
uh, whether it should be using libdisk FS or libnetfs, and libdisk FS would probably be better, but that depends on whether or not we can map devices like into memory. Hmm. I would say I think it's worth keeping an eye on uh, trying to do trying to figure out how to do do, do the view stuff right. Uh, would, or if the views API even is the right thing for a, a common file system abstraction layer, because this is getting to be more and more of an issue in the Linux kernel. We need to be able to run our file systems in user space as well there, just for security implications. implications. Uh, trying to track down every single, well, people are now wanting to be able to run file systems with completely untrusted file system images, which file system code was never written or designed for back when these file systems were written. And in C, trying to do this after the fact is kind of a nightmare. <laughs> so you're coming around to these ideas of microkernels and writing stuff in user space and privileged. Yeah, yeah. I think the microkernel ideas never really went away. And it would be nice to have some flexibility. Run your code in the kernel when it's nice, when you want that for performance. Run your code in user space when it's easier from a maintenance point of view or easier from a security point of view. Uh, so it'd be really nice to just come up with some common APIs to make this less of a hassle. And maybe Lib LibDiskFS has some better ideas than views that we could bring into views. Who knows? But I, I don't think we should lose sight of, uh, of the possibilities there. C tries to be somewhat higher level than views because as far as I can see, views just yeah, exposes Linux's VFS more or less directly. Whereas the disk of us, it has these abstractions of you know, files and nodes and it requires you to implement a bunch of callbacks on a higher level. And then it does a bunch of logic on its own. On the other hand, perhaps some of this logic is implemented in a kernel in Linux. So maybe if you just doesn't have to do it. And then it's all about, you know, how it's native Mac API. So you won't be able to use the disk of us on, on Linux either way. So yeah, you, you might want to look at it, but you won't be able to reuse it. Hmm. One of the things I wanted to ask you, though, so on Heart, we have this library called libstore, uh, which abstracts away different like ways to store data, particular file systems data. Right? It can you know, read from a Mac device. It can read from a file. It can read from NBD, the Chemos network block device protocol. It could read from another task's memory. It could uh, read from another store, unzipping it on, on the fly, and a bunch of other cool things. Uh, and so this libdiskfs and all of the hertz, basically all of the hertz file systems are written based on this libstore. You can mount a file or a device in the same way. That's uh, interesting. Right, so I had a Quick look at CR's UE of use code or other BKFS tools repo. And you seem to be just opening files uh, several times with fsync and other stuff. Uh, tell me more about what, what you're talking about. Uh, I mean, in user space, when you try to mount BKFS, your cord. Mm -hmm. uh, opens the source device, right? Mm -hmm. Just as a file. Mm -hmm. Whereas we would probably want to, it's to use libstore on the heart. OK. Uh, what does libstore get you over? No, I guess by abstracts away how exactly you store the data. And, and file storage is just one of the sources. OK, yeah. Instead of doing a syscall, you're you're calling into a library that can do whatever in the same address space. All right. So you say store read to read some bytes, store write to write some bytes, bytes, store map to map it. Uh, this would actually be useful. One of the things I would like is to teach user space bcachefs to. Uh, 
to read it uh, from QCAL2 images directly. The metadata dump tool writes out QCAL2 images. And if I could just use those directly, it would cut down quite a bit on my workflow for dealing with those. Oh, I don't think Lipstar supports that, but that would also be called to add to Lipstar. Well, that's that's where that's the indirection layer we need for adding that. What, what, what's your smoking kit? We're just curious. <laughs> oh, just, just All right, hold on. So QCAL can be mounted using Camo's what's it called Camo image tool, right? So Camo itself speaks NBD the protocol, and then you can mount it on Linux using Linux's NBD model, and you can mount it on the heart using Lipstar's NDB backend. Oh, that's a roundabout way. <laughs> right. It sounds like we just need a uh, a lib store QCAL2 implementation. That would be pretty cool, except that I know nothing about how QCAL2 works. QCAL2 <laughs> is, is a pretty simple file format. Just reading from QCAL2 is pretty easy. It's just uh, like a radix tree and a ref, ref count table. All right, so I was wondering if it would be possible for us to try to patch Clipstore into your, you know, your repo uh, whenever you try to read or write data. And that probably wouldn't work on Linux, so I don't know, perhaps it would need some of devs and whether that would be acceptable for you upstream. If we can figure out a way of building it, it, it really shouldn't be that hard to have a a shim layer for libstore that isn't real libstore, but just maps back to Unix file system API. If we do that, then that'd be fine. So that way we wouldn't be adding if depths to the code, it'd just be some header file thing. Probably if you patch out the Mac device backend and maybe other Mac specific stuff, it could even build on Linux. It wouldn't be that useful because you'd have basically the file backend and the gzip backend. But sure, you could try that. But then again, you probably wouldn't want the application files tools built to depend on a hard library. Or would you no, just we like wouldn't a want a hard dependency now? We would just like to have a shim in your in your repo that says if they have if they have heard and then emulates the star API. There's something like this in the uh, the GNOME project too. Uh, some sort of GO. Is that what I mean? GO. Yeah. Right. Is there any commonality? Not really. I mean, yes, yeah, they are kind of trying to do the same thing if you think about it, but they're also quite different because GNOME obviously is using GObject and it's trying to abstract away things like network resources like over HTTP or over SFTP, whereas the heart is trying to abstract away Mac devices and tasks and Mac memory objects. Could the like dependency on uh, web store be like a configure time, like the configure script could be configured to either enable it or disable it, so it wouldn't be a wouldn't, wouldn't be a problem. Wouldn't require the the code to be present while it's trying to compile it. That's what I would imagine. Okay. I've got a friend who's on his way to visit and his all the flights to Vermont just got canceled. So he's stuck uh, at the airport. Yeah, no worries. We, we do appreciate you taking the time to chat with right. us because we're yeah. I think it'd be pretty cool to have a next generational file system that works on the herd. That'd be awesome. Uh, Nicola, yes, there is a design document I believe Kent's been working on. I don't know how fleshed out it is, but I think it's pretty good. 
there's a bunch of design documents that I've written at different times. If you click around on the website, you can find a bunch of stuff. There's a high level architecture document and then there's sub design docs for things like encryption and duration coding and God knows what else. It's it's a big file system. It's it's almost hundred thousand lines of code now. Jeez. What's 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 butter at? Is that uh, I think like hundred and fifty thousand last I looked. Okay. So something that's much bigger now, right? So again? I mean, in your original design document, well, maybe it wasn't as much of a design document as a sales pitch, uh, as a scene on Patreon. It said that yours is going to be so much simpler than better of us. <laughs> well, how, how much of, us, of this is still true? Well, at the core, I think it it is. It's BcacheFS, like I mentioned before, is structured much more as a file system on top of a database. And so there's a really clean, small, uh, database transaction layer API. And that I've been working on coming up with a, uh, a Rust uh, interface for. And then we'll be able to start rewriting high level BcacheFS code in Rust a file at a time. If I can ever make time for that. I figure out after it gets upstream, I'll hopefully dive into that. Uh, but that does simplify things a lot. Just the, the core database part, E-tree and journal code is maybe like 25,000 lines of code. And on top of that, so that's the core library. And then you've got a lot of different features on top of that that just interface to the the, the database. Um, Sergey, if you have more technical questions, please jump in. But Kent was mentioning earlier that you could take um, libraries from the kernel and run them in user space. It sounds like he's already done work to make libraries in bcachefs run in user space. Are there libraries we could pull from bcachefs and just use on the herd today that might be useful? Uh, I think the R hash table code is the most prominent example. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's fairly specialized stuff. I have to go through and look. Kernel work queues are really slick, high performance code that I think that would also be useful in user space and elsewhere. Uh, I haven't seen an implementation like that elsewhere. Tejun put a ton of work into work queues and making that portable to user space I think would be a worthy effort. I haven't done that yet. I've got my own crappy uh, hacked up or Q implement implementation that's not nearly as fast. Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of grungy work still to be done to kind of pull, pick things apart and turn things into proper libraries. But if that was done, I think that would be like like you're saying with the .bsd rum kernel thing. And that would be a better approach than people have been taking. There's a lot of people that also want to run stuff in the kernel in user space, but they've been taking the more of the approach of running the entire kernel in user space. There's user mode Linux back in the day. There's a newer thing that, that people have been talking about on the FS Develop mailing list. It's maybe a little bit smaller than user mode Linux, but it's still the whole DFS layer. And I think that's the wrong approach. We need to be looking for small libraries that can be just tweaked and that used uh, as a small self-contained unit. Just taking the whole kernel and turning that into user space thing, that's not a very maintainable long-term solution. We want to be making our dependencies small and understandable. Sergey, do you have any more technical questions? I've got lots of them. <laughs> 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 How much time do you have? Right, so one of the things you mentioned Rust. So are you planning to rewrite all of the cache files into Rust eventually? That's or the goal. It... Uh, it's a serious goal, but uh, it's also one that's hard to know when I'll have time for. As right now, I mean, the big struggle in the kernel is that we're dealing with this massive C code base. 
what, 16 something millions of lines of code last count. And our teams are not growing. If anything, in file system land, they're shrinking. More code, but fewer, fewer engineers to maintain that code. Plus it's all written in C. That's not a recipe for long-term happiness. We need to figure out how to make this code easier to refactor and understand and easier to debug and how to make it have less code bugs in the first place. We're caring about security more and more than we used to. Uh, and these code bases are going to be around for decades. Uh, I fully expect BcacheFS, if I, if I do this right, to still be in use 50 years from now. Uh, but the file system in the future really needs to be written in Rust. Rust cuts down on bugs versus C by like 80, 90 percent. So it's ridiculous. Uh, I've I've done enough uh, programming in Rust to uh, to know from experience this is real. This is the way to go. Long term, what we need is programming languages that allow us to do embedded correctness proofs in the language itself. Like this is what cell four was trying to do in C. And the idea was very ahead of its time. Right. And as people realize that, that trying to do correctness proofs of C code is just not practical because C was never designed for this. C is the long layer of abstraction. We need to be changing the programming language the languages themselves. And Rust uh, is a huge cracked a huge part, part of the problem with the borrow checker and limiting the scope of mutability. Rust gets you most of the advantages of a, of a pure functional programming language in a language that's actually useful for systems programming. And that's, that's huge. Uh, further on out, I'm hoping we get to dependent types and get some of the ideas from Idris. Uh, what's, what's Idris? Idris comes out of the Haskell world. Uh, it's it's like dependent a, types. It's like a proof uh, want serum solver to, or something, right? It's not a serum solver. It, it, it is like basically Haskell with dependent types. Yeah, yeah. And that lets them uh, simplify the language for even Haskell. And dependent types uh, enables a lot of theorem proving. And I, I think once tried to write a simple text editor in Idris, and I had to write a lot of proofs about how simple things like string concatenation works, that you know, concatenating string of length, length n and length m gives you a string of length <laughs> n plus m, and that it's not less than any of the original strings. <laughs> so yeah, I never got to the actual text editor part. <laughs> so I imagine that wouldn't be as suitable for the kernel. But well, yeah, it's surely great. Yeah, we, we won't be writing all of our code with full correctness proofs uh, by any means. But it would be really useful to, to be able to have correctness proofs for the code that matters, like our sort implementations. Uh, Any time you've got code that depends on things being sorted correctly, it really, really sucks to have bugs there and have, you know, you can even have subtle bugs in your comparison functions that result in output not be, like that completely breaks your sorting out of the algorithms. That's some place where you really need correctness proofs. Uh, as someone who's done a lot of hardcore data structures work, uh, this is this is where you do want correctness proofs. And I think dependent types are something that could one day make it into Rust. Uh, dependent types rely on a reflection and first class types. And these, these are things that we would like to get into Rust anyways. Uh, reflection would be a, a, a better approach than like, Rust, the Rust people are discovering the, the, the powers of uh, first class macros. You know, macros equivalent in power to what the Lisp world has had for years and years. And they're wow. awesome. You can do everything with them. Uh, but you can do everything with them. <laughs> Are you a Lisper kit? Do you like uh, Lisp? I've, I've never actually written any Lisp, but I've followed and studied the Lisp world for years and years. So, okay. uh, one of my favorite programming languages is Kernel. It's a scheme dialect that adds first-class environments. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's super cool. 
uh, first class environments let you do things like refer to the current environment or create a new environment. And they have a, uh, a variance of eval that takes the environment as an additional parameter. So this is perfect for, say, implementing REPLs. You can construct an environment for, for the REPL and put whatever imports you want in the REPL. So you can do a REPL with like 20 lines of code. You don't have to implement a, a programming language from scratch. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the, the, the hilarious thing is that environments, first class environments, this is something that compilers actually implement today and just a hacked up uh, ad hoc way because this is what we need for debug info. So if we just re-implement all our debug info in a more standardized, performance, always available way, we'll clean that, that stuff up and then we'd have first class environments. Okay. Um, one thing we haven't really mentioned yet and there's probably something that's worth talking about is licensing issues. Um, is that kind of a problem? Uh, BcacheFS is GPL2. I'm not going to revisit that. Is it GPL2 or GPL2 plus? That's a big question. Uh, I would be fine with it being GPL2 plus. I would have to consider whether it's ever been promised to be GPL2 only. Are, are you the main author of BcacheFS or are there other people we'd have to reach out to? Yes, but I've done it for multiple employers. Okay. Oh, okay. One of those employers is now completely defunct. <laughs> so, I'm, do those employers own the copyright then or do you own the copyright? They own the copyright. Okay. Go Google is one of them. Oh, oh no. okay. <laughs> <laughs> So like libviews or whatever is going to be the only thing that links directly against the cache of us, probably. And it's going to run in its own process. So that's perhaps the only thing that would have to be GPL2 only. Libviews would be in the same process, but isn't libviews can be uh, LGPL? If, yeah, I can is do it? that as well. Really I'm, oh, yeah. I'm not enough of a lawyer to understand how this is supposed to work, but oh, on the other hand, Libfuse would, would be its own framework, right? It wouldn't link to NetFS. That may simplify things. All right, so we could make that work. You'd probably want all the your your fuse to DiscFS or NetFS code all be running the same process, though. So you'd probably want that to be LGPL. It's I think I think everything in the official herd repo is GPL three, and I think uh, oh. I think um, I'm not such no? sure, but I'm I'm not sure either way. Mo yeah, okay. most of the kernel like runs in different processes though, so Let me I, check. I don't think that's necessarily like a, a roadblock okay. to the licensing. We can have like one specific library that has a different license. I think it is JPL two plus at okay. least at least the disk of Okay. So yeah, that's what we have. But I heard that people wanted they have to switch to JPL three only as soon as they get rid of the old Linux drivers. So <laughs> if, if the cache of us was to JPL two only, that would be an issue. Yeah. GPL3, everything except that part of it. Yay, more licensing fragmentation. <laughs> What's your thought on licensing, Kent? Is that okay if I ask you? Uh, I prefer to think about it as little as possible. Okay. I don't want to have to talk to the lawyers. Okay, fair enough. I just want to write code. Fair enough. Um, so I had kind of scheduled this meeting for an hour. I want to be respectful of Kent's time. If you want to stick around, that's totally fine too. Um, 
Uh, Sergey, do you have any more technical questions? Otherwise, I was going to start asking Kent how to become a file system developer like he is. I think I got going to get running in a couple minutes, but uh, yeah, how to become a file system developer? Uh, like, if you want to get involved in BcacheFS, just join the IRC channel, see what's going on. Uh, I do a fair about an amount of mentoring. Just just pick something that interests you, study it, write code, and if you're writing code, then then I'll give you help with understanding what you need to learn. All right. <laughs> there's there's lots of fun stuff to do in in BCash FS. Okay. What what Let's do you, do you have like a short hack entries or easy hack entries list somewhere? Oh, I I probably got my private to do list has some good things. Okay. Yeah. There's bigger stuff on the roadmap. Yeah, I think just just looking through tools for little paper cuts would be a good thing to do. Yeah, I imagine your new website where you're keeping track of uh, the bugs and uh, what do you call that? A, con a continuous integration. That's probably been pretty helpful. Oh yeah, the uh, the test infrastructure. That's all completely mine. Sweet. I would love for the test infrastructure to be a a bigger project. Getting good test infrastructure for the kernel has been a, just a ridiculous <laughs> slog. Uh, there's another guy at Samsung doing a competing effort called, was it KDevOps, which I'm not the biggest fan of because it's, you asked me over-engineered and a big bag of, it uses like Ansible and uses kconfig for configuring your tests. It's like, tests should just be self-contained thing that you, you run and they give you output. There shouldn't be any external configuration. That's more the K-test approach. A test approach is a test is just a, sh a shell script, and then K test provides the functionality. Um, oh, and the important thing is tests are self-describing in terms of dependencies, including kernel config dependencies, VM configuration, and then K test does the work of building a kernel with the appropriate config options, launching a QMU VM with the appropriate options and scratch devices, and so on. Collects all the uh, test output on standard output. Uh, it gives you pass fail as an exit code. Uh, a lot of good stuff like sharding up tests between multiple workers. Uh, facilities for interactive development. You can SSH into a test VM as it's running, connect to the kernel debugger. Uh, I want to get that stuff converted over to NixOS actually. It would be the next big project in pay test because building and managing dependencies sucks. And I think there's the potential for NixOS to make that stuff a lot less painful. Like right now, one of my big hassles with is uh, it builds all your different kernel revisions, but if bcachefs tools updates, then I have to uh, update that manually on the, the the head node, and then that gets pulled out to the, uh, the workers. Then the workers will build bcachefs tools, but they don't build it as a proper package. And now that they're building with Rust, they will run builds in the same work directory that tend to stomp on each other and break and in not nice ways and it really should just be building it as a nix package and that would make that a lot less fragile and then we could do things like properly hopefully track both what kernel re revision we're testing and which tool revision we're testing if, if you want to use nix by all means um i'm i'm a fan of geek system that's also a lisp so that's kind of fun to mess with yeah, but that's more fragmentation. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, does anyone else have any more questions for Kent? 
looking forward to using your file system, whether it's on Linux Thank you. or Heard. Okay. All right. I think that's right. I think that's about it. Um, maybe a final question for you, Kent. Why have you not given up on this? I mean, this has been a long project for you. Uh, I, I see the potential of it. And honestly, technically, it's turned out really nice. The, the feedback that I get from users is a large part of what keeps me going. Uh, people are running my the, the code that I just chucked over the wall that I barely tested, and they say <laughs> that it works better for them. It's more reliable than better of us. Dang. Uh, and we don't really have anything else on the horizon. ZFS is never going to get merged. And also, ZFS is the old indirect block uh, design. Performance is never going to be what we need it to be. Uh, I think BcacheFS is technically what we need out of a file system. Uh, and I'm pretty excited to, I've just been taking my time to get it right. Uh, I had funding for, for years and years that let me kind of work on it at my own pace and just focus on getting things right. And that's, losing that was a bit of a hiccup, but I'm, I'm confident that the new funding will arise. Uh, there's there's people that are I think, gonna pony up or, or Red Hat would actually be willing to hire me if they didn't just do a bunch of layoffs. So <laughs> it's bad timing. <laughs> well, Kent, thanks for thanks for chatting with us. We really do appreciate it. Um, we might send you thanks a email too and like encourage you. So okay, definitely go donate to Kent's Patreon. Thank you. See y'all later. You. Bye. Bye.